Hi, uh, welcome to yet another episode of Be Positive on etbrandivity.com. This is your host, Ambi Parmeshwar. Today we have uh, Sumit Mathur, CMO of Kellogg India. Hi, Sumit. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Ambi. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, really looking forward. As I was telling Prasad the other day, this is a welcome change versus all the regular corporate interviews we do. But look forward to catching up. Greg, good, good. You opened. Uh, you gave me an opening. So, uh, be positive is not about what great companies are doing with marketing or what are the great challenges they have. It's more about people. So we interview. We speak with. CMOs across diverse set of industry to understand where they started, what education they went through, uh, schooling, family influences, and then on to their college education. And then, of course, uh, if they did MBA, where did they do MBA? And then, did they have any mentors? And then on to their career, saying where did they start? What challenges did they face? What did they learn? And how did they how did they progress? So. Uh, Sumit, I mean, your CV is like gold-plated, schooling, and then uh, IIT Delhi, IIM Calcutta, uh, undoubtedly the best business school in India, if I may say so myself. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and then to, to Indusan Unilever, and then now at CMO at, at Kellogg. So this story, this 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 this, this show is about personal growth, triumph, challenges you know, objections, rejections, etc. So before we get into your career, uh, Sumit, I'd like to give the, the viewers a bit of background about your early schooling and early college days before you got into IIT. Sure, sure, Amdi. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit of that. But I must say, I went to the business, best business school, agree with you, and also one of the best technology schools. So. <laughs> yeah, definitely one of the good ones, uh, but you know, may not be the best. <laughs> the best one is in Chennai, Madras, so to speak. But anyway, IIT uh, Delhi is a great yeah. institute. Yeah. 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 No, so coming back. So, so I mean, I, I was, a, uh, I mean, I spent most of my childhood in the city of Taj, which is Agra. That's where I was born. Uh, and I spent almost till uh, till my 12 uh, being there, and you know some very very fond memories. Uh, I must say I had a uh, I had a very happy happy childhood. Uh, Ambi, uh, I was in a typical middle class family, so you know all the middle class values that come with it, uh, but also in a joint family. Uh, so we were. I remember. Uh, you know, almost all through my childhood, uh, we were or 10 odd people, you know, my dad, my mom, my sister, my grandmom, my uncle, my chacha uh, and their kids. Right? So all of us staying in a staying in a three bedroom or a three BHK, as we call it in Bombay, a three BHK in Agra. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, it was great times, right? Uh, in terms of, you know, learning as you grow up how to. Be happy with what you have. How to be able to share with what you have, and uh, and yeah, and still make the most of it. So, so you know, two things. Uh, MB stick. I mean, I remember from those times. Apart from, of course, uh, lots of fond memories. And I seriously believe, you know, some of these things shape you as you grow up, right? So, so one slightly in jest, right? I'll tell you, is that uh, you know I get ready today and take a bath very, very quickly. And, you know, I, versus, you know, my wife and my daughter who, you know, is in the bathroom for half an hour. Uh, and I, was, I used to, I wonder, why do I do that? And when I reflect, I realized that when I was a kid and we were 10 people at home, there was half an hour for 10 people to get ready in the morning. And that hasn't gone away even till now. So, so yeah, so some of those, but seriously, on a, on a, on a serious note, I think, uh, you know, I was in a family. Uh, where, you know, we were middle class, but, you know, my father was in business, a small time business in Agra. And uh, our, uh, uh, our family's philosophy was <laughs> So if you know what I mean, right? Uh, famous, there was a famous song as well. Remember, I think, correct. Yes. Uh, I think Ashok Kumar was there. In yes, that song. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. So, but have, 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 while being in that situation, I really give a lot, you know, a lot of what I am today to my mom. Uh, uh, I do think that in the midst of where we were in a slightly business family, education was there, but not the most important. But my mom was the OSS in that sense. And she really, really cultivated 
for me the importance of discipline and education and then of course things happened over a period right. of time so i mean i think i think we have never so it's actually wonderful to have someone who is born and brought up in agra in our show because this is also a pet thesis of mine that compared to the days when i was in iit and iim 80 90% of the students used to come from the big cities yeah. you know the bombay delhi calcutta maybe bangalore hyderabad uh, you know now things are changed and i think you're a testimony to that and you know coming out from agra and then going to iit great to see so how did this iit happen did you go to kota or did you uh, study in agra only or no no i studied in agra i did not do any of those of course you get those correspondence materials etc that we all did and i was saying right so i remember you know I, as a kid i was decent in school but not a top performer ever and i think that's my journey and we'll we'll talk about it when we get to that uh, but you know i sort of finished my 12 couldn't really crack anything great at that point of time uh, but then said at that time that you know there are two options right at that time my, my 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 a lot of my family said you know go to a college in agra and of course you know you can come and do the family business etc uh but yeah as i said there was some influence of my mom at that time right and she said that you know give it a shot uh, and i guess that's where probably the trajectory changed i mean uh, so i spent a good one year uh, part of it i did some coachings in agra but primarily self is what i would say uh, in terms of studying it and then yes uh, got into got into iit so i think uh, it was a little bit more of self study uh, knowing a couple of friends asking them what did they do what do you look at and that's how that's how iit happened and then did you enjoy of course you must have enjoyed iit and uh, uh, anything to remember from the iit days did you avoid which one did you do metallurgy mechanical electronics no i was a civil engineer uh, and uh, i i was building i, I my, my my aspiration was to build bridges uh, <laughs> uh hopefully i am able to do a little bit of bridge building with my consumers now yeah. <laughs> but yeah that's what i started with uh but but you know i, I think iit you know, of course you learn a lot no doubt right uh, uh but I, i think if i if i honestly take back one thing from my experience at uh, iit delhi is um, is it's a great leveler uh, and personally for me you know you feel like you are tax whiskers you've gotten into iit you know you're the smartest man on earth and then when you go there and you realize oh boy <laughs> yeah and i think that for me was the single biggest learning it also taught me one more thing to be honest it taught me the value of resilience and attitude versus just being sheer brains or iq and you know when you are with really really intelligent people right and i would i have no shame in telling you that i would probably the bottom in terms of iq at iit delhi uh, but i hey i did well over the over the four years five years i was there i had a very decent gpa i passed out well i was in the top 5 of my class in- and that's pretty good yeah so you're not part of the chetan bhagat gang that six point no, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no but i must tell you i think the point is <laughs> but uh, but yeah but i think the point is um, that i i really learned that if you believe in yourself you can do wonders and you know i still remember one incident amb uh during my iit time sort of demonstrates this point on resilience i remember i first second year second sem uh and i got jaundice uh at iit right and you know i came home and then um we were wondering what to do so my parents went with me we met a very nice professor i still you know fondly remember him guy called shashi mathur who used to teach in civil and he said kya kare uh, should we you know he is not well should he stay at home for a month month and a half the professor said that you know attendance is there so you can drop him a you have to drop a sem right at that point of time and and my parents being my parents said that can't happen right you have you signed up for a four year course not a four year month month six month course so so but anyway he gave a lot of he gave a good advice why don't you leave in here it's not as if this hasn't happened before right so i stayed in campus uh, and of course there was family who used to bring me food in delhi uh, but more importantly my circle of friends and right i still remember i don't, i don't know whether i should say it now but i got a lot of proxy attendance during that time uh and but the thing is that was the stem where i got my best gpa 
because you know i was worried that what will happen right and so therefore i did put my mind to it and it was one of my best performing semester of course my friends still pull my leg saying you know you got that gpa on our back but but i guess just the point is uh, is that you know that that thing has stuck with me and i still remember it because it told me that you know if situations are tough but you have the resilience then more often than not you can uh, you can navigate it i think that's i think uh, i think i think uh, you know you had a four year iit experience i had a five year iit experience and um, but you know the kind of friendship bond you form in iit and i'm saying iit as a as a kind of a placeholder because any any i think any hostel education i believe yeah that uh, hostel education is a must for a uh, undergrad so yeah. i think this uh, day scholar thing i think is not a good thing uh stay in the hostel you make you make some good friends you make some bad friends you pick up bad habits you pick up smoking drinking whatever else uh, you want to do uh but the friends you form the network you form and they stay with you for life and i think uh, nitish tiwari and again iit bombay uh, uh grad uh was a colleague at uh, at my old old agency he captured this entire friendship thing in that wonderful movie right chichore Yes, yes, right. yes. But yes. how how these friends are for life when they come? You know, so amazing. So after IIT, did you work or did you take the cat? No, no. I was one of those who straight away moved. But but you know, before I go there, I think this whole point that you mentioned about the circle of friends, I actually absolutely agree. You know, it's very interesting. I have these close six friends. Uh, MB. They're all from the same wing at IIT Delhi. right even this hostel called jwalamukhi hostel uh, and you know till pre covid every year we do a bachelor's trip and we go somewhere or the other and we have been doing that for the last 12 years now uh, once a year so thanks to our spouses who allow us to do that as well but yeah we have stayed in touch and i think those friends are for life uh, and they're a great sounding board in fact something i believe everyone should have right you need to have a good sounding board Where there are no expectations, but great advice and great friendship, it does work. It does work. And with those friends, there is no title, nothing. You probably yeah. called by some funny surname, uh, funny oh, yeah. name, which I will not use in the show. <laughs> um, so everyone has a funny nickname, and you yeah. stay the stay the same. So uh, great. So after IIT, uh, one last question about IIT. Did you go to that you know water tank top which Chetan Bhagat writes about? <laughs> No, no, I didn't go there. <laughs> oh, no, no, I didn't go there. I think Chetan Bhagat took a little bit of liberties. But... Hey, some of the things he did capture well, but no, I never went to the water tank. <laughs> okay, then, then what? Then I am uh, happened, happened. Yeah, yeah, I think I am aut- almost automatically happened. Uh, I'm to be fairly honest. And you know, I'll tell you an anecdote there again. You know, but and you, when you reflect, you think some of the things that formed you. I remember I gave. Hindustan Unilever interview at that time. Hindustan Unilever interview from IIT Delhi as well, right? And at that time, I was always, I had always, almost, almost decided by third fourth year that you know I want to, I'm not gonna be a technical guy. I saw that happening, and I thought Hindustan is a great place, and I did decently. But the, uh, the interviewee said in the end that why don't you do an MBA and then try again? At that point of time, so. So I took it to heart. <laughs> so as luck would have it, then I did an MBA from IIM Cal and I joined Unilever. And I mentioned that in my IIM Cal interview. So, so did you do summer internship at uh, Unilever? No, no. In fact, I did my summers at ITC, another great, great company. MBA. In fact, yeah. a, a lot. So of- I should I should share this with you. Yeah. I've written that in my in my book Spring yeah. Yeah. that my uh, journey into advertising was because I was rejected by. Hindustan Lever twice. Once when I was <laughs> in IIT, just like you. Yeah. Uh, but there, I deserve to be rejected because I, I I muffed up a very simple question. I deserve to be rejected. The second time I got rejected was when I was interviewing them with them for summer internship at IIM Cal, where I was a, a very good student. I was one of the top students yeah. there. Yeah. And they asked me a some trick question, you know, about will you sell this watch to me or something like that, which I gave a very logical answer, and I blew that. And that's when I said. I had a bit of an epiphany, saying, "Why am I chasing this company? I should do what right. I want to do, etc., yeah. etc." That got me into into advertising. And when later in the final placement, when Nissan Lever came and had shortlisted me, 
and they said where is this guy they said no this guy has been placed so they said no we are the first company how can he be placed they said no he did a summer internship and he is gone mm. Mm. so in my case i i dodged the uh, hindustan lever uh, <laughs> bullet but so you joined hindustan lever um for, straight out of uh, i am cal right and uh, so in i am cal tell me uh, any you know courses you remember any any advice to people who are going through a lot of mba students also watch our show so yeah i think there's two advice and you know uh, one in hindsight and you sort of hinted on that question i do believe one should work before doing an mba uh, seriously yeah. i didn't do it and you know some of the things i learned as tricks of trade and through the experience of my initial couple of years working i wish i had them to make a better use of my mba time and there were people there i remember there were used to be in i am cal and in my time a lot of people who were who used to be the scra people if you remember who used to join uh, after having done a stint at railways and similarly from other stints uh, and i just feel that that's something one should always do it does how big, you know, how big was your i am cal batch and how many people had work experience in that batch i would i think Our Iron Cal batch was around four uh, hundred odd people, if I remember correctly, and not more than twenty percent were were working. Everybody uh, else, uh, everybody else was a fresher. Yeah, that's a bit of a shame because I yeah. would, I would feel in, in we were lucky. We were only hundred of us in our batch, and close to forty forty five percent was people with work ex. Yeah, and you know we used to call them mama and all that because they were yeah. much older than us, but they yeah. they brought a different flavor into the classroom. absolutely uh, because they bring their own experience and they talk about you know what happened what did happen etc so i think again if someone you know one of our viewers watching here uh, they are in a b school try and be friendly with the with the guys who come with work experience because you learn quite a lot lot from them so any any courses you remember at uh, i am cal which you uh, still go back to in a sense Yeah, I, I remember I was fond. Don't ask me questions on the courses though anymore, Ami. But uh, but I remember micro eco was something I used to really enjoy at that point of time. Uh, I also enjoyed listening to. I uh, I don't know about the subject, but also love really enjoyed listening to Linchat, who was the professor there at that point of time on humanities. Uh, so yeah, those are things I really fondly go back. To. Of course, I did the sales and the marketing and the strategy and the finance, all those. as well but those two courses i really do fondly fondly remember yeah lin chat uh, is management of self that that comes yes. up with you know we've interviewed a few people from uh, i am cal and and lin chat comes uh, comes quite often you know as yeah. one of the courses yeah. so it's it's actually amazing that you someone who's graduated 20 years ago still remembers what happened in that in that course it's amazing so in uh, um, so why did you not go to itc uh you know you did summer internship at itc itc is a great company they might have actually made a pre placement offer to you uh you gave that up and went to leavers so they did not give me a pre placement offer of course <laughs> but but having said that uh, no, it's honest yaar i can't i can't cook that up but no i think i'll tell you what uh, i i believe that my love for sales and marketing started with itc uh Mm. I'd heard of it, but you know when I really worked, and I was in sales, and I still remember in my summers. Which, which was, division? Which division were you? Assigned? Tobacco. Tobacco. Oh, tobacco. oh, uh, ITD. Okay, yeah. I, so I was based in uh, Saharanpur. Uh, they have a big factory time. there, right? Yes, 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 oh. yes, yes. They do, they do. Uh, and you know this whole area of Saharanpur, Rurki, Dehradun, where where I was, uh, you know, learning the tricks of trade as a sales guy. and itc has a fabulous fabulous distribution setup it had it at that time it has it now and i still remember going on a cycle with uh, the salesman uh, and you know uh, and what i what is amazing at that time it felt obvious but i realized how difficult it is for some other companies is that you know cigarettes it was even at that time an all cash business uh, mb no credit right uh, which you know we now every every FMCG company has to live with that. So he used to go on a cycle. He used to say, "Aapko aaj kiti wills chahiye." He'll give it to you as the dukan uh, to the shopkeeper, and on his way back, he collects the cash because by that time, probably the shopkeeper has already sold it. 
so that was the real time demand that that business had but anyway uh, learned a lot of core distribution fundamentals the power of brands uh, at that point of time uh, in in saharanpur brand and after that i think i was fairly clear that you know i do want to i do want to move into sales and marketing not so much from the courses that i i am but certainly from my experience at uh, itc and then Uni- unilever hindustan lever obviously happened because it was the first company uh, and it was probably one of the best sales and marketing companies to go to and they chose me because i told them that you did not choose me in iit so <laughs> you told me you they know they had made a uh made a wow to you that you know abhi nahi lenge lekin mba karega to zarur le lenge great <laughs> okay okay great you know what? just to digress a little bit on this uh, ready stock operation of itc for, for viewers who don't know uh, most fmcg companies send a sales rep who books orders he goes and gives the order to the redistribution stockist in the evening and the redistribution stock stock then takes the order and delivers it the next day to the retail outlet now this is in a sense very inefficient so itc cigarette distribution probably is the most efficient because the sales rep carries the cigarette he delivers the cigarette collects the cash it's all done right and then and these are on set routine so i think they call on the same outlet you know once a day or once every two days or something like that it's a beautiful routine so uh, the entire sales system i am told is now Uh, at least fmcgs are relooking at this whole thing that why should you send people twice and you know it's a colossal waste of time and effort etc etc so so from i am cal you joined uh, unilever and again you must have been posted in some remote bareilly or wherever where did you go i was born a up ka bhaiya i am let me put it this way <laughs> so you were sent back i was sent back i was sent back so but to be fair what unilever to did is and and up rural so unilever had a, or instan lever had a urban setup and a rural setup so i was handling the rural part of central and east up so as rural and as hindi heartland east up is terrible yaar you are from yeah. west up you are from a yeah. more sophisticated part of up yeah correct <laughs> if, if if there is something called sophisticated up <laughs> you know uh, lucknow is also very lucknow yeah, right of I mean, course lucknow. of course very like now here kanpur again this is uh, you know beautiful uh, uh, in a sense but uh, east up is as close to bihar as you can get right so absolutely but some amazing experiences as in, i i think that i i really cherish some of those uh, you know you are a young turk you have come out of mba obviously at my time i had no experience of leading teams and suddenly here you are talking to you have a team of 35 40 people far more experience on running these businesses than you uh, and how you work with them how you lead them is uh, is uh, is a is a journey in itself i i still go back and i have some my earliest mentors are my sales officers and the uh, uh, because i learned leadership from them i looking at them understanding how they work i could bring in the excel sheets i could bring in uh, the a little bit of brand thinking but the softer leadership skills is something i really picked up from uh, picked up from them i learned a lot a lot of other things also i remember too so you know i i i had the uh, opportunity of in my sales to do up rural and then also to do delhi metro and it was a top end portfolio so i did two things and it's very interesting at in up i still remember this experience and i remember i was in uh, I, i think a couple of months into my sales role and i went to raibareli uh and my distributor there half politician half distributor and um, and he was saying let's go and he was going for his uh collections uh, and he had a katta or a revolver with him while he was going for his collection <laughs> and i was like this is also a world yeah so as long as it wasn't pointed at me so so that was fun and then the other spectrum of it i remember is a uh, because i was handling the top end portfolio in delhi and i remember uh, you know that was a lakme business of unilever and i was a sales uh, asm and i learned how to apply all nail polish shades on my hand to sell them in sarojini nagar <laughs> so <laughs> i just felt that the diversity of learning but that's the magic of a company like unilever and the magic of sales i would say that you get to experience the length and breadth of the country and the length and breadth in terms of what sales can be so you are taken from rural sales up to 
to Delhi selling cosmetics to uh, top end Khan market. Uh, oh, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> amazing. So this this was how long? Uh, two three years? Yeah. So I I, I I did sales for around three and a half years. Uh, you know, first two years in uh, UP, and then followed by the Delhi Metro, uh, Delhi Metro stint. Then, then what? Then you were sent to Argentina, or you know, actually after that, I got my first brand role, and that was uh, Ambi on uh, on Sun Silk. So I was the brand manager on Sun Silk in two thousand and seven. Is when I came into that role, and Argentina was a part of that stint because there was a secondment, and we had gone there to experience hair. It was a big category, big category in Latin America always, and uh, and I, I guess those were the times. Uh, and you know big learnings right i think for everyone uh, but uh, you know the shampoo or the and the conditioner category in india has exploded over the last decade right and i was very lucky that i was in around the time of 2000 and 2009 i remember the penetration of shampoo still used to be 35 40% and conditioners used to be negligible at that time but look at it now and i think couple of things have really worked uh, i think the role of Low unit price points in shampoos as a category has catapulted penetration. Uh, you know, we were a couple of friends who were the, in the hair category. Uh, you know, between Sun Silk, Clinique Plus, and Dove, which were the three big brands, and Clinique All Clear at that time. And yeah, and I think the role of the one rupee and the two rupee sachets and how they can explode the business. I saw that happening in front of me, and it's a learning for life uh, in terms of how uh, you. But you have to get it right. I think in terms of uh, what the price point is, what the dosage is, and most importantly, that you are able to drive incrementality and not just downgradation. I think that's critical when you do that. Uh, and I saw the business explode. I mean, last I know, shampoo penetration is now ninety plus in India, and even conditioners is uh, is exploding uh, as well. So in the last ten years, that category has changed. So that was my first thing. tell me uh, i think i think you spoke about secondment to argentina mm -hmm. and i also know anecdotally that uh, the latin american uh, uh, countries the per capita consumption of of shampoo is probably the highest in the world right it, it, they they wash their hair even more often than than even developed countries like us or, or europe or whatever so how was the experience of a secondment in argentina where you know the language is uh is is what is is uh, is spanish uh they they party i mean i remember my own uh, latin american colleagues we used to meet in the global meetings and they are ready to party till 1 o'clock every night but next day morning 7 o'clock 8 o'clock they are in the meetings so i used to wonder what do you guys do yaar i mean and they are all nicely you know women are all freshly washed hair 7:30 8 they are in the meetings so i don't know what they drink i don't know what what they do so how was was it buenos aires where did you go Yeah, I was primarily in Buenos Aires, uh, uh, and you're right. I mean, I think our body structures are different. I don't think Indians can hold that much alcohol and be okay the next day. <laughs> I think that's a that, that's a basic body tenet. But but jokes apart, I, you're right. I think um, uh, they love to party and they love to express themselves. And hair is a brilliant way for women and men alike to to express what they stand for. Uh, at the end of the day and i i learned the importance of regimens right and you know in india it was just use a shampoo actually we used to use soaps right at a not not a long time back but really the role of regimens and how you as if you build the regimen of pre soak you know pre wash shampoo then condition etc etc i think that's how a lot of these developed markets i mean latin america is one you'll see a lot of that happening in southeast asia also now i think that's how a lot of this uh, the per capita consumption or the category building for uh, hair products has happened across the world yeah. yeah so it's amazing right i mean uh, per capita consumption of uh, shampoos and hair care products are probably the highest in latin america similarly look at per capita consumption of facial products you know yes. beauty beauty products is, is japan and korea yeah. where uh, again uh, a colleague of mine went to korea and came back and said look an average woman applies 25 different products on her face every day i said kya 25 said yeah <laughs> she wakes up she applies some scrub yeah. then she applies yeah. something else then she applies something else the night before she goes to sleep she applies something on her face something under her eyes oh, wow you know so 
I mean, this is consumer culture, you know, gone, uh, gone on steroid or something. So that was Argentina. Then I also saw that you spent some time in, in Iran. Uh, that, uh, in the current context, would be very, very interesting to know what happened. Uh, how was it? Yeah. So actually, I have two. You know, one. Uh, you're right. I was in Iran, but I think there's something about, and you know, when I re- when you reflect, you realize that something which has. Uh, made me curious about the entire Middle Eastern belt, which is Afghanistan and Iran. And uh, I'll tell you two anecdotes. First, I'll talk the Iran piece, of course, because that's the question you asked. So I got a lovely chance. When I was in ASM uh, in Unilever, uh, Unilever Iran was just setting up their distribution setup. And uh, they needed some people to help them set up because they didn't have any experience. And Hindustan Unilever uh, was the mecca of uh, distribution. And they said, Let's get them some two young ASM Turks to come in. So there was me and there was one more good, very close friend of mine, two colleagues of us, who went there for a couple of months to help them set up their distribution structure. Uh, and therefore, we worked with the Unilever Iran team at that time. Uh, and, you know, I was placed in one, I was primarily uh, in Tehran and then the ancillary and he was placed in one more city at that time. I forget the name. Uh, but yeah, I, I think big, big learning, of course, uh, in how how that culture is and how to set up distribution, I feel very proud of. But I do remember two things, uh, and which 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 stood out for me. And the, I for my in my life for the first time saw women taxi drivers in Tehran. I had never seen them in India, and it just goes to show the unconscious bias we all have, right? Uh, I had never seen them, but it is safe to that extent, right? Uh, at least at that time, it was for sure. Um, uh, and I was when I realized this. They were amazing roads. So the infrastructure quality that they had, and obviously they have oil and they invest and so on and so forth. But fabulous infrastructure, not just in the main city of Tehran, but even if you go outside. So I was very impressed uh, by by some of these things. And just it's it's always stayed in my mind that don't make points of views just reading the news. Uh, you might get surprised later on. That's uh-huh. that's that that stood out for me for Iran. Or or WhatsApp forwards don't. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there is a big myth, right? I mean, all of them are uh, so all of them are burqa, etc. But burqa doesn't exist, right? I mean, they probably wear a hijab, but that's about yeah. it, right? Okay. I mean, that's about it. Hijab actually covers their hair, so it's 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 fine. And and actually, I mean, so they wear a lot of um, lady taxi drivers in in yeah. Iran in Tehran. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this because, was it was safe, right? because it was it was safe for them because the the capital punishments right at that point of time uh, uh, yeah. and this was the time uh, what ten years ago this would be two thousand and five it was not as if you went there during no 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 no, no. Shah no, of Iran's period no. when he was trying to build another uh, you know it, it, it was Islamic Republic of Iran that's okay. when we, oh great that's great great. great. And then I think I also saw you went to Vietnam. What did you do in Vietnam? You know, as I mean, I've been lucky, uh, I would say, to have experienced a lot of countries uh, during my stint at Unilever. So, you know, Argentina, you talked about Iran. I was in Vietnam. I also did MBA role in audit. Um, uh, uh, and we'll talk about it. I think it's for the, it was probably my best learning experience where I was in international audits. So I was just traveling across countries. So I got to visit Japan, China, large parts of Africa, a little bit of Southeast Asia and so on and so forth for various things. But yeah, I, I think if I you know reflect on all of them, to, to be honest, um, I think the learning of how cultures are different is something that you always carry. You know, I'll give you a couple of anecdotes. Uh, during my stint in Japan, and I was there for two months to audit them. You know, as internal audit, you go, you look at their processes. Uh, and... What I realized is that, you know, I'll call them for a meeting, right? And uh, let's say the time of the meeting is three. And I was there at three, but the managing director was there five minutes before. So I realized I'm late if I am at three. So you have to, to reach earlier. So that was a big, but, but they're very, very, uh, uh, I mean, we all hear about Japanese uh, excellence, uh, but I think the time they're really, really a stickler for. I think the second one I saw was in Thailand and, you know, again in audit and, you know, Audit is tough, right? It's all about conflict. You are telling people probably what you are doing is not right. And I found that, you know, they agreed to everything I said. They said, yes, yes, yes. But I realized when they are saying yes, it's the fact that they want to avoid conflict. They don't want to make you feel bad. It doesn't mean they agree with you. So that's another thing I picked up picked up in Thailand. Yeah. 
So I think lots of very interesting cross cultural tidbits that one picks up. Ambi. By the way, I also realized something as I traveled about Indians, uh, my and myself, and about a lot of Indians is we don't listen. We love to compete. We love to talk, and I think that's a very important thing for any young marketer. I would say in the roles they are. Uh, of course, I mean, I, and I guess to some extent, it's also about the way all of us have been brought up, right? Uh, competitive. uh group discussions interviews that's what we have seen in life but there is a there's a real power to listening uh and when i think uh when you go out is where i realize that about myself that um, you might want to talk and that's critical uh but the real power is if you are able to observe and listen you'll get much more and that's something i really picked up about us as a culture yeah i think uh... listening is a very powerful skill and uh, in coaching uh, we are trained to develop a skill called the active listening uh, active listening is getting all your senses to be focused on the person so that the person knows that you're listening to him or her rather than you know letting it come in through one ear and go out the other ear so we don't uh, we don't listen we don't listen well enough i think i think it's a It's a point. Uh, point very well taken. So, uh, from you did audit and did you did you work on any any famous brand campaigns in India when you were in Unilever? Were you behind the the Brook Bond? Uh, some very memorable campaigns you come out or you had moved out of marketing onto something else by then? Yeah. No, I, I did come out, come on to and I think Brook Bond Red Label. I remember very fondly. Uh, that was the part time when. You know, there's a journey. There's a time in your life when you start. I mean, there's an initial part when you are learning a lot, but then you start contributing. And I, I, and I think the T uh, time when I was there is when that change happens. In, uh, happened in my career. And you know, I remember the Brookborn Red Label time. Uh, and you know, it was not just Red Label. I was also handling Three Roses, which is in South India, so big brand there, bigger than I guess how Red Label is in North in terms of sheer brand equity. And then a couple of. uh mirror brands in pakistan sri lanka uh bangladesh uh, on similar uh, proposition i think i won't take the accolades for some of the brilliant stuff on red label which is the hindu muslim women ad etc that's happened it happened just about when i moved out of my role but i will tell you one thing that i really picked up during that time was and then i'll come on the learning of it uh, as well and i think what i what we were at that time in the transition T as a category when I came in was trying to solve for a barrier, which is that T is unhealthy, and a lot of work that was happening was around how T is healthy because it has flavonoids, theanine, etc., etc., and therefore it helps mental sharpness, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. And that was good; the business was fine. But what catapulted it was going back to what T truly does, which is brings people together. And that was great insight. I mean, I keep giving this example. You know, uh, Tata Tea did that uh, great campaign on Jagore. That tea yeah. is not just a refresher; it actually enlivens you. It is emboldens you. So, I mean, that's a great insight. Similarly, not to take away from what uh, you guys did, the whole thing about tea is about coming together. Yeah. It's again a very powerful insight. Uh, conversations happen around tea. and i think i think they managed to build it in in multiple ways so how did the insight come is it, i'm sure this is not a global insight it's it's your own it's a yeah. indian insight yeah. we always knew that mb and i think that's my biggest learning that a good marketer needs to be a brand historian uh yeah you know if you go back in the history of red label you will realize we have done that in the past and we have work it's just that marketers get bored with things and try something stupid to screw the brand uh, but uh, and, and that's something i've always followed since then and you know i learned it from one of my mentors sudhir who i worked with uh, sudhir sitapati i see who's in itc now yeah yeah uh, who's with gcpl now gcp sudhir sitapati oh sudhir oh yeah, yeah sitapati yeah. sorry he's in G- yeah he just left to join yeah he just sudhir left yeah, yeah, yeah. he also wrote a fabulous book yeah sudhir yeah, factory yeah. Yeah, he's a he's a yeah i know him yeah yeah so I think the one thing I picked up at that time, which is to when you get into a brand, the first thing you need to do is to go back and look at the history of. But it is uh, Sudhir Sitapati, and I, I know he's he's made a couple of nice presentations on brand history of some Unilever brands. So 
he's probably a historian at heart yeah and uh, and we used to have this tool which we used to call advertising archaeology yeah where you actually pull out and you get a brand you need to pull out all the old advertising yeah. and see if you can learn something from there and what you're saying is right that um, you know you know brand marketers have to be historians as well as you know uh, look at the past and look at the future the problem with today's brand manager they are impatient they want to change the campaign every 6 months yeah. and change the every age change the agency every 2 years <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah but i must tell you i think i i have a, I have a very i mean I, there's something i have learned uh, and we it is work it's database not just my whim i have seen the best performance of advertising good quality advertising in the second day versus the first year because memory structures build right and i have seen that when i worked on sun silk i have seen that when i worked on red label i have seen that when i worked in kellogs so hopefully three data points are good where we made an advertising it worked okay in year 1 but it exploded the brand equity and therefore the performance because it built see un- now there are two ways to do it either you have so much money like the startups of today that you build reach in one month right but most fmcgs don't work that way they work on continuity and therefore you have to give your advertising time uh, in the current clutter so that people remember it and then they uh, and then you see a lot of it uh, working so consistency is a very very important virtue to have with advertising don't get sucked into trying to do new things uh, every couple of months i am absolutely I, against it i do this talk on branding where i talk about the uh, four uh, problems uh, with branding today one is of course uh, you know consumers are becoming more educated more knowledgeable brand families are becoming very very complex multiple brand extensions and of course media is getting very fragmented and it's a problem and i say there is a fourth problem which is the biggest problem is uh, is the brand manager <laughs> <laughs> so i gave a talk and i don't know i think it was prasad or someone who wrote in a in a business journal that uh, biggest threat to brand management it comes from brand managers fair <laughs> enough <laughs> so how did the, how did unilever happen uh, how sorry how did kellogg happen you spent what 14 15 years in unilever and then you moved to kellogg so any memories of mentors you had at unilever uh, whom you want to kind of acknowledge here you spoke about sitapati anyone else So I did my चौदह साल रामचंद्र जी का बनवास है तो as I call it in Hambi in Unilever but in a just I had a lot of fun you know I think I think it is mecca of marketing and sales and I learned a lot uh, about everything and I think there are many people to be honest who I uh, I look up to uh, and I think I think more than one I can mention three four for some of the things I've always picked up from them right I already talked about Sudhir too uh, and I think he's a historian and a big idea man right I think that's something I've always noticed about him. I I I really look up to Nitin for his discipline. Uh, Nitin Paranjpe uh, MP and I think uh, uh, you know when he gets out the tenacity and the discipline of going after one thing and I think that's something in leadership I really really picked up about uh, yeah about him. I also remember fondly a long time back you know I don't know whether uh, you had the chance to meet him Arun Adhikari uh, who was I know him uh, well. I know him well. His wife also used to used to be a, a yeah. copywriter for a period with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he headed Hindustan Unilever for some time. He was in laundry, and I love him for his humility. Uh, and that's a virtue that I personally believe is very, very important for leaders as well. So you Arun can have also Arun is also I am Cal by the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're right. You're right. So I, I, I remember Arun, and uh, last, of course, I remember Mohit, who uh, Mohit Anand, who uh, was with me in uh, uh, Unilever. Uh, and one of the reasons why i moved to kellogg's as well to be fairly honest uh, uh he he got me here uh, but yeah i remember mohit because you know i i i i again one of the guys who is uh, cutting edge on eq uh uh and be right so knowing everybody by name and really knowing what makes people tick i think that becomes a very very critical uh, ability as a leader uh apart from just your braininess and your eye when i think that's what mohit stands for but one thing you know all of them stand for uh actually two i would say uh, which is something i try and foster in myself as much as i can do one is courage to take decisions i think that's a basic 
tenet on leadership young marketers to think that do you have the courage to decide and take decisions and take big bold steps and the second is self awareness knowing what you are good at and what you are now not and therefore you build your right moats and your right bridges to support you on i think this these two have found across all these four people uh, uh i mentioned as my as mentors i look up to no great i think i think i don't know mohit anand hopefully i'll get to meet him some day but nitin is an old friend uh, so is the uh, the other interesting thing you know i've always wondered you know when um, i'm just digressing but it's an interesting little episode i used to work on a brand called bajaj aman drops and uh, but and dove launched this hair hair oil right uh, called dove serum i remember mm, yeah absolutely fabulous packaging and it had a, a petal inside the bottle and and i was blown and in fact i messaged uh, you know uh, nitin saying yeah this is fabulous this looks great and you know all the best and um, we are going to compete with it mm. but but i don't know why it it, it didn't take off and and then they withdrew the product within a year of launch which is Uh, which helped bajaj almond drops but uh, i think i don't know you know i don't know why they gave up maybe there was a global diktat saying don't get into hair oil you don't know the category blah 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 something yeah. other must have happened so uh, i was a little surprised that you know like you say that tenacity hair but you know how did they give up uh, that's yeah. it's little too early so let me come to the last uh, bit of uh, your your uh, you wanted to speak about something about the way consumer is changing the digitization the analytics uh, yeah. how that is changing even I, we know all the, that is changing definitely for all the online merchants the e-com merchants the tech apps the education apps and we've had people from both e-com from you know uh, uh, from uh, places like byju and all coming and talking to us but i think it'd be interesting to get your perspective on how digital marketing analytics are all changing in the you know are, are affecting classical fmcg marketing yeah. it will be, be good to tell us something about that i know i think it's an area that i'm really really passionate about and you know a lot of work that we have been doing at kellogs in the last uh, couple of years since i have been there one of course was the core category piece that i talked about uh, overall uh, to build category development but the second is what i would like to call the pivot to digital and basically in two spectrums there is one part of it which is you know how to deliver you know the traditional reach in this new environment right you know we are all very comfortable with television reach then youtube happened and now amazon and amazon dsp that happened right so how do you look at them together is something one really really needs to think about and i think uh given there are no and you know this is something i keep having a conversation with mindshare or uh, gujar agency partner and my media head as well is on how do you look at the real reach you are deliver- delivering because you don't know that right and i think the rudimentary ways in which we have done it is there is some random duplication that we do to say so many common people etc but you know where we have reached as kellogs is to say choose your mediums and then keep driving sufficiency on each medium and what does sufficiency on that medium look like right i think at a very simple level versus trying to make it very complicated for yourself so that's the part on reach the second part uh, is this whole area of how do you drive engagement uh, and you know typical funnel right awareness to consideration to conversion how do you drive consideration for your portfolio and a lot of work that we have been doing is really building what i call ownable properties on digital right uh, that's critical so we have something called amazing creations which is nothing but tasty nutritious and convenient recipes from kellogg but how do you build them consistently over a period i think that's very very critical to do along with figuring reach and the third piece of course is how do you con- drive how do you drive conversions at the bottom so the search the a courses of the world and so on and so forth but you know this is all fine i think everybody will talk about it and i think because of this the forum i guess the biggest opportunity i see for marketers you know i don't think there's a digital marketer or a digital ma- manager or a brand manager that will be separate in the future they have to be one the challenge i'm being is that uh, i find that there are either people who are digitally very savvy or i find people who are good strategic thinkers it is very difficult to find a combination of them and that's a massive massive opportunity that lies uh 
whether it is on the client side or on the agency so is a is an interesting point you raised and we discussed it with you know one of our, one of our previous guests i think it was dipali uh, where we spoke about the yin and yang of marketing today there is this digital marketer who understands performance marketing and yeah. you know clicks you know this you know that and there is a brand marketer who knows image top of the funnel etc these two don't seem to be talking to each other yeah. right and I, and i use this term the spray and pray so you put some money on tv some on youtube some on facebook some on here and and you hope and pray it all works yeah yeah good old days i mean when i started my career in advertising we didn't have tv it was cinema yeah. it was cinema and you know you take so many percentage of cinema theaters and you know then you, i had a formula i used a what is called a querel formula to work out reach and ots and we had, we used to figure out what is the reach yeah. for the ots so you know this is the target audience and you need to get 30% reach and 4 ots and only then it will work then later with tv came it became easy yeah now what do you do with digital do you have a similar measure that you know i remember at one time we had 80 trps per week uh, is a minimum requirement right and then and you do 80 trps a week for 6 weeks and that's a campaign and then you figure out how to how to buy it at the best price so yeah. what do you do today do you do the same thing or you doing thoda tv mein dalte hain thoda youtube mein dalte hain thoda idhar dalte hain fir dekhte hain kya hota hai you know no from what i have learned and, and this, this is something which we can have an entire episode on to be yeah. honest yeah i know i know my back of the envelope or my experience on what i have seen till now i have been looked at is identify from your target audience and you can take whatever cut of your tg whether it is psychographic or demographic or something else but then know what are your mediums to drive reach and affinity and order them and keep delivering sufficiency on one and then the sufficiency on the next and then versus trying to uh versus so, trying to spread yourself to thin explain sufficiency yeah so i'll i'll tell you what it, i mean by sufficiency so let's say on uh the female on, on let's take the example of kellogs right uh, and let's take the example of i have a advertising thought which is what we, what i would like to call morning fuel for daily triumph which has a television advertising right i there is a certain uh, or rather than television av advertising right mm. uh, now i have based on the entire you know typical volume to trial to awareness to consideration funnel i have identified what is the kind of reach i need to deliver right now when i have identified that reach i know my cost optimization curves for television which tell me that till this reach i can deliver without the cost going up beyond the point of time right. and that's what i look at for television then i do the same thing for it. let's say the second best biggest medium which is youtube for mm-hmm. example mm-hmm. again you will draw the same curve and then deliver sufficiency for that but it's a very important thing to remember what i'm not trying to do and i've tried that and i have failed is to make an assumption ki isse 10 reach aayegi isse 2 aayegi mila ke 11 ho jayegi you don't know that nahi hota hai you don't know that right yeah. you say is 60% audience on youtube sufficient for me right you say is 40% audience on tv sufficient for me and then keep delivering as you become bigger you have more money you can go to more mediums i think that's the journey i have tried to follow which has broadly worked for a set kellogg but we are obviously keep we obviously keep iterating yeah, and and also probably you know just a caution to other to viewers is kellogg operates at the top uh probably 20% of households whereas the same rule may not apply to Correct. the next 20% next 20% so i think it's a great uh, point that you made that there is each medium look at what is sufficient to create an impact and only after you hit that sufficiency go to the next medium don't be too much of a hurry to do, do something on insta something on facebook something on you know youtube something on google something on this and then and then you do this spraying and praying so great yeah thank you so let me come to the last uh, part of our conversation which is you know we got a lot of aspiring cmos uh, watching this uh, this this conversation so uh, some advice you want to give to youngsters who are starting out on their career in marketing or someone who is a young brand manager or a young product manager some advice you want to give them one philosophy that i always keep for myself and i think it's really really important uh, for every marketer is to keep learning and unlearning and upskilling yourself and that is what is going to keep you relevant i think the speed of change has become even faster over the time when i started my career to now and therefore you know honestly it's a it's my own personal number one challenge 
to stay relevant be aware and upskill unlearn and keep learning and i think for the young guys who are starting now guys and girls it will be even more critical so that is the only advice i'll give everything else can happen but don't feel don't get complacent that i know enough you never know enough yeah so i have this famous thing right what education does is to teach you how to learn yeah right and yeah. that and then, so you know you think when you pass out of an mba school you learnt everything sorry your yeah. learning is just starting Absolutely. mba school actually prepares you to be a sponge it puts a lot of holes in you so that you go out and you keep learning right so great yeah so let me come to some general interest fun question so like you said you traveled all over the world and uh, so i definitely like to know which is your favorite city and why honestly it is bombay because my family is here <laughs> No, no, Bombay is not accepted as an answer. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. But I tell you, uh, two cities that I have really liked for very different reasons. Um, one, I have really liked Rome when I got a chance to visit, purely because of the amount of history and culture that place has, uh, and I really enjoyed it. And it's a, I, I like relatively warmer European climates versus colder ones. So that is another reason I, I, I love. And the other country. Uh, city or country or whatever you want to call it uh, that i find I, i find they have done a brilliant job in singapore i find the way they run the country and the way it is is it's a it's always been a example on how you can set up and structure and run things so i think those two i really really uh, think are uh, pretty good okay so now come to books uh, ott series music knowing that you're a history buff probably you prefer historical uh, otts i don't know i'm just asking so i do read so uh, two books i really like uh, one uh, and no surprises is sapiens uh, again because it sort of navigates history in probably one of the most interesting ways uh, ways i have read i also uh, read a little bit of stephen hawking uh, uh, those are the couple of areas i enjoy ott you know actually I, i would probably disappoint you because i won't say history uh, but i like a lot of um, slightly wilder wilder stuff in terms of uh, you know i don't know whether you have seen these programs called dexter or ozark uh, which are more into uh, a little darker in their ways i I've, i've you know i i gave up on dexter after two episodes yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, maybe there's, maybe there's something dark Yeah, I don't know. I get to watch Dark Mirror also. So yeah. Yeah. So those I enjoy and you know I cannot sing for my life so I stay away. The only music I like is my daughter learns classical singing so I really enjoy listening to it. Do Hindustani is it? Hindustani classical. Yes. Oh lovely. Lovely. In fact one of our previous guests told us how MS Subbalakshmi was his neighbor and he used to go and wow. you know, talk to her so it was again great. So with that Sumit uh, we've gone way past the time we had asked from you so thank you very much for joining us on behalf of uh, etbrandivity.com uh, and be positive show thank you very much for joining and let me thank all the viewers for joining us this is Ambi Parmeshwaran signing off uh, and uh, Sumit once again thank you very much Music